point of view. Do you see what I see? Of course not. We all bring our own experiences to the act of viewing art. What we see is framed by what we know and where we have been. As an artist, I can present to you what I see. Through the lens of my history, my tools, and my abilities. I can try to give you a glimpse into my thoughts and my experiences. But do you see what I see? Or do you see what you see? The art we create is a result of our point of view as the artist. So as an artist, can I just throw my work out there and hope you get it? Or is it my responsibility to give you the full context of what it means to me? Perhaps my pieces should be displayed with an essay about each and my thinking as I created it. Some of my friends who are artists feel that enhances the viewer's experience. Would that be more effective to communicate my point of view? Because I am in control of what the camera captures, it is my viewpoint that is conveyed. I find this image to be exciting because of the light dancing on the edge, the texture left by the sand on the glass. I also love the little bubble. But where does this image meet you, the viewer? What is your experience? Maybe you think it's boring. You might not be as excited by the light and texture as I am. Let's see if understanding more about me and my thinking might help. Did you know this piano stool belonged to my next door neighbor, Paul, when I was a child in the Feltonville section of Philadelphia? Of course not. It sat in Paul's basement with a broken player piano that was out of tune. He used to let me into his house to play the piano. Paul would sometimes help me with my piano lessons. The piano was in his basement because he took it apart, carried the pieces down the steps, and reassembled it. When I was around 10, he told me I could have the piano when he died. I didn't believe him. Many years later, when he died, he left everything to my mother, who said the piano was mine if I wanted it. But I lived on a sailboat at the time, certainly with no room for a broken down player piano. Plus, it was still stuck in the basement of that Philadelphia row house. So I kept the stool only, and I remember Paul. I love the antique finish that's worn away in parts. I love the interesting lines of the turned legs. I love the wobble it has because of the metal casting that connects the long screw that adjusts the height is broken where it meets the seat. I love the metal claw feet that clutch glass balls. The balls have been flattened over the years from being moved around the concrete floor in Paul's basement. It's a wonderful prop for me because I think it's one of those ugly, beautiful things. Thomas Aikens used the same chair in many of his portraits. Did it have sentimental value for him, or was it just a chair? Does knowledge of the chair contribute to the experience of viewing his work? Did his father sit in that chair? Did it have sentimental value to Aikens? Probably not. Moving right along. I found myself reminiscing over past events in my life quite a lot this semester, for several different reasons. Many of the things we are doing in foundation classes remind me of my high school art classes, classes that took place about 30 years ago. Another reason I find myself reviewing the past is because my good friend Jack passed away during this semester. I met him in 1981 when he was my high school guidance counselor and homeroom teacher. The following year I had him for physics. He was a brilliant and funny guy who loved to collect cameras. He also taught sailing. Both of these activities became a big part of my life as well as I became an adult. It's a natural thing to reminisce while mourning a loved one. Fair winds and clear skies. I believe the obstacles that clutter our path are the product of our perception on life. By allowing obstacles to darken our path, we cannot see the learning in their challenges. We allow ourselves to be boxed in by the limitations we have created and imagining that our mistakes will send us over the cliff, falling downward never to be on top again, we become stuck, afraid to make mistakes. But it's all just a matter of perspective. Richard Bach said, argue your limitations and sure enough they are yours. I'm now a student at the age of 46 because I will not argue my limitations. And interestingly, now by attending school, I have agreed to learn and produce work in the context of other perspectives. 
within the structure of classes and assignments, allowing me new points of view under the instruction of others. I don't know about you guys, this is hard stuff, but it's the only way to expand our horizons. But where am I coming from? My classmates talk about their recent high school experiences, and I have to stretch my memory. Only one piece survives from my high school art years. We had to copy a masterpiece in sophomore year. I chose a Vermeer, and I was visiting at my grandparents while doing the homework in 1985. And they liked it so much after it was graded, I gave it to them. It found its way back to me a couple years ago when they both passed away. It's interesting to compare my work over a 30-year period. Still looking back. The first time I attended Temple was in 1984. I was a music major. Being on campus again and right next door to Presser is taking me back to then. The awesome Chinese food truck has been replaced with the burger bus, and the biggest change is this wonderful school. I was a lousy music major. I left after one semester. However, Jack, still my friend through all this time, never abandoned his role as guidance counselor. He kept telling me to go back. It took 28 years, but I finally listened. Although I'm not good enough to make a living at it, music has always been a part of my life. When it comes to musical instruments, I was the jack of all trades and master of none. Keyboards, woodwinds, brass, a little bit of strings. In high school, I started with the flute and worked my way down to tuba, hitting nearly every major instrument along the way. Percussion and fun portable instruments like recorder and penny whistle came later in adulthood. It was after high school that I also began exploring more with photography and built a dark room in my house that I used in the mid to late 80s. No trip down memory lane is complete without a stop in childhood. I was the oldest of five kids. We had a boisterous house, and I had about 50 cousins because both my parents came from very large families. I found the photography artist Julie Blackman really hit a nerve with me. Her snapshots of children and the chaos that surround groups of children echo my own experiences. I can only imagine the torture my siblings endured as I learned music at a young age. But it's the kind of experience that will echo through the generations. Children's personalities can shine through in pictures that are posed and candid. The camera may record the moments, but does it really reflect the experience? The characters in Julie Blackman's work show us both their formal and informal side. Like the children they are, you never know which one you will see. And in the same light, who do they see when they look at us adults? This piece is my favorite. I love the shape, the clear texture left by the graphite table. It can mean many different things depending on context. My nephew David, with the imagination of childhood, insists it is a cheesecake. In fact, he thinks it would make a nice dessert after PB and J. So, point of view. Mine or his? Whose is the correct viewpoint? And who determines if it is the authentic viewpoint? As the artist, I must put my best work forward, true to my ideas. Others may not see my work as I do. It is the individual who grants authenticity to an idea. Sailing along. Two of my glass pieces were created with this piece in mind. It's a little antique glass box covered in white protruding hemispheres. It belonged to Jack's mother and sat on her bedroom bureau. Even though she passed away in 1976, it remained there until 2005 when I moved it to the china closet for safekeeping. The repetition in the pattern draws me in. It begs to be handled. The clear glass gives a blurry hint of what lies within, but the lid must be removed to truly see. The sea monster and graphite waffle iron piece were both inspired by this cute little box. I wanted to see if I could make a glass piece that also had that kind of tactile appeal. My pieces may not have the same functionality as the little box, but I've noticed that people like to handle them. Maybe they really aren't related pieces, but I see them as part of the same family. The sea monster piece, however, seems to fulfill its nickname a trick of the light, and it could be dwelling on the ocean's bottom with the coral and the shells. I love sea creatures. 
So now you have an idea where I am coming from, my point of view. In my work as an artist, my thought processes rarely come through. And in my experience, rarely does a viewer or customer even ask for my point of view. The work has to stand on its own without my long, boring explanations of how I was inspired. But the viewer has their own experience, and although the image may not signify the same thing for them as it does for me, as the creator, significance may still be there. It is the perceiver who decides the point of view. I see my life when I create my art, and you see yours when you perceive it. Thanks for listening to my point of view.